by the time you hit the end of Naoki Urasawa's monster, you've probably got a lot of questions. There's still a number of threads left open, pieces of the history left unclarified, expected answers left unresolved. It all leaves a lot of wiggle room in the story for different theories to sneak their way in, and today we're going to look at the top 5 monster alternate theories, where things we thought we knew may have played out in a totally different way. And we're sticking to the ones that genuinely might be true, the ones with some actually good support. No Sook was secretly Ava in disguise or anything like that. Let's get into it. Number 1. All for Nina After Johann flees westward with the Liebitz after Kinderheim, we see him playing with Nina during a press event. While the Liebitz talk about their new life in the west, the twins run off to play in a nearby garden. Johann grabs an acorn and plays a game with his sister, right or left. She guesses correct and asks him to open up his other hand. Both have acorns in them for her. It's all for you, Anna. All for Nina. Johann's motivations through the series are, well, complex and never fully communicated. By the end, we get this heartfelt moment where Nina runs up on Johann and forgives him. While he stands in the middle of a town he has brought to bloody ruin, she forgives him. Perhaps finally coming to the realization of what those words meant years ago. It was all for her. In this theory, everything Johan did was for Nina. Why he went against the organization, why he hunted down the monsters of their childhood, even in his own twisted way, why he killed the Fortners. It was all for Nina, all to protect her from the monsters inside her and the monsters out. We can start this idea right back in The Three Frogs. Nina comes back traumatized from the Red Rose Mansion massacre, and Johan takes on her memories. The series pretty consistently points to this moment at the mansion being the birth of the monster, so by taking on his sister's memories, he is letting himself become a monster, attempting to take the burden from his sister. Later on, he goes on to prove to those that still seek the twins that he is the one and only monster. He got his sister out to a normal life and manages to convince the organization that he is the only one worth seeking. When Nina gets pulled in anyway, Johan goes through and destroys all of those that would hurt her, including, we see, himself, letting Nina kill him if he truly is one of the monsters in her life. But in the end, we know that this wasn't the case, her coming to realize, perhaps at the end, that it really was all for her. Number 2. Reuniting the Children during Grimmer's investigations in Prague, he gets captured by Zeman and the secret police. Zeman says that they're looking for a tape of child Johan inside Kinderheim, a treasure showing deep into the heart of the monster. With the tape, they hope they can control Johan, and with the monster, they will be able to gather the products of Kinderheim 511, the dream that the superhumans the old regime fought to create will rally beneath their king Johan, a dream to reunite the children. Most readers will assume that Zeman was working under the organization, searching for the tape under orders of Chapek. But the reuniting the children theory suggests that maybe it wasn't the organization at all. This was Johan's plan. A plan to give himself a private army, a hundred men like Roberto willing to fight and die for him, to fulfill his every last wish. Now before we get into the meat of why this theory could actually be true, let's first remember this moment after Johan kills the cops at Suk's apartment. Johan, disguised as Nina, calmly walks down the stairs, and what do we see? Grimmer, emotionless, didn't cry at his son's funeral, unshakable, practical Grimmer, is stunned just from seeing Johan. Grimmer's new friend could be dead or worse upstairs, and he stands there, completely lost, watching his alibi for Zeman's murder and the prime suspect in Beerman's murder just walk away. So could Johan leverage his way into controlling an ex-Kinderheim army? It doesn't seem unlikely. The meat of this theory actually comes from the sequel novel, Another Monster. One part in particular spells out this theory pretty clearly to us, something that we probably wouldn't have thought of without it. And I suppose, a uh, spoiler warning for that book. Journalist Werner Weber interviews Detective Suk about why there was so much blood around the Kinderheim tape, and we're picking this up in the middle of chapter 13. So Johan attacked the secret police to destroy the tape that proved his existence. I believe that was part of it, but it also could have been because he wanted Beerman's other materials. For example, say, a register of all the other boys at the Kinderheim. When I heard the tape, Johan himself had already tampered with it and removed the registry. What do you think he'd do with the Kinderheim 511 registry? Not hold a class reunion, I assume. He probably wanted to make contact with them and control them. That's what kind of person Johan was. But we know Bonaparte's methodology wasn't just at Kinderheim, it goes back to the reading circle at the Red Rose Mansion, so let's pick up a little further on in this interview. Is it possible that he could have taken something from the mansion when he burned it down? What do you mean? 
For instance, say there was a registry of the seminar members that was still hidden in the mansion. Oh, I never thought of that. If he was looking for the list from Kinderheim 511, it's certainly possible that he could have done the same here. But I have the feeling that even if such a registry existed, Johan might not have been interested in it. He altered the tape that was in the security box to leave a message to Dr. Tenma at the end. He said that he finally knew where he was going. He was following his memories. So in the instant that he arrived at the Red Rose Mansion and understood his identity, he lost all interest in controlling others. What? So I think. But did Johan really lose interest in controlling others? He goes on to manipulate Chapek into his own defeat, he still keeps Roberto around doing his bidding. What if he got those registers after all? A register is never mentioned in Monster itself, so this is a peculiar idea for Urasawa to raise in the novel unless it had some merit to it. Could this have been what Johan was doing behind the scenes? Perhaps by the end of the manga, this is what Johan went on to do. It was finally time to reunite the children. Number 3. The Three Frogs Experiment We know the twins were born as part of a eugenics experiment run by Franz Bonaparte, a plan to bird the supermen who would one day lead the nation. Their mother tried to escape before giving birth but was dragged back to the facility, kept tightly watched until the twins were born. Sometime after their birth, the mother tries again and does manage to escape, fleeing with her two children to hide in the three frogs. Hide, but not escape their captors. The section of time between the birth of the children and their capture at the Three Frogs remain one of the biggest question marks in Monster. Typically, it's assumed that the mother did escape with the twins. When Nina goes into her hypnotherapy scene, some translations have her say that they escaped to go to the Three Frogs. The alternate theory is the Three Frogs experiment, that the twins' entire time in the frogs was one long experiment, mostly buried in the twins' forgotten history, a long-running education program set up by Bonaparte from the twins' birth till that fateful day of the massacre. Shortly after the twins are born, we get this quote from Chapek. These children will undergo the Franz Bonaparte education program. This theory shifts the tragedies of Johan and Nina's early life from moments to continual. It's no longer a rough decision in a room full of dead men that make the monster. It's an ongoing destruction of psyche and a reshaping of personality from birth that twists Johan into what he becomes. One of the big points in favour of this theory is the fact that Johan has the nameless monster book at the Three Frogs when he's left alone. Could Bonaparte have brought it with him to leave with the child left behind? Possibly. Could it also have been there all along with Bonaparte's other books? Also possible. Bonaparte did use his picture books as education material, something he would quite happily put in the Three Frogs experiment. Also, Johann does make allusions to the other Bonaparte books, The Peaceful God and Big Eyes Big Mouth, suggesting that he has come across them sometime in his history. Another big point is how Nina is received when she is taken to the Red Rose Mansion. She is hailed as a success to the joy of the experimenters, a moment that seems a lot more important than just old people clapping for the eugenicized white girl. This looks more like Bonaparte showing off the results of his five year long experiment. Number 4. Johan Johan One of the final reveals we never get in Monster is the truth behind Johan's original name. Tenma learns it from the mother, and yet it's never told to us. Well, what if that original name was Johan all along? This theory originally comes out of what was most likely a translation error. When we get the flashback scene with the twins on the German border, something strange happens in the English translation. Nina calls out to her brother by name, the name Johan, a name that he is not supposed to have until right after this, when General Wolf names him based off the storybook. So why does Johan already have this name? In other translations, a more general term for brother is used here. However, when translated to the uh, most spoken language in the world, they use the name Johan. Well, perhaps because it is his true name after all. At the end of the manga, Johan's name is returned to him, and in this theory, that true name is Johan, a confirmation that the monster he believed himself to be is truly who he is who he has always been from the day he was born, a monster crafted from the very beginning. The Johan Johan theory goes even deeper, and let's be real, this is the part where it starts getting a bit fringy. It's the old triple twist, where once we believed it was Johan who went to the mansion, we get this half twist that it was Nina all along. Well, what if even that is wrong? What if it really was Johan who was given to the mansion? The memories surrounding the mansion are fraught with trauma. Nina fights for a long time to gain an understanding of what happened. 
For a good long time there, she believes Johan that he was the one who went. Though after a fashion, she gains some memory back and believes that she was taken. Us the readers just assuming that these are true memories. There's still the possibility that she's wrong. In the same way Johan may have been running around believing that he went, why could the same not be said for Nina here? Taking on a false memory and believing it to be the truth. So much of Johan and Nina's journey revolves around them having an incorrect recollection of their past. They once both believed Johan went to the mansion. Why is that memory any more incorrect to the new one that Nina believes in? In the same way, at the end of the manga, Johan tells Tenma about how Nina was given to the mansion. Perhaps even then, right at the end, he is still hiding himself from the truth that he was the one his mother threw away. A monster crafted from the very beginning. Number 5. Monster Nina There's a number of people and things you can label as the monster of monster. The monster Nina theory refers to the sort of darkness sewn into the twins, particularly the monster sewn into Nina's psyche. The monster that grows hungry and threatens to eat its way out. And this theory is maybe the best one I've seen that looks into Nina's monster. There are a few moments through the manga that tell of Nina containing the same darkness as her brother, but of course there is one scene in particular where her monster takes center stage, the hypnotherapy scene. In an effort to unlock her past memories, she gets Dr. Gillen to put her under hypnosis. Some memories of her time in the Three Frogs start to resurface, and it's once she hits upon memories of the Red Rose Mansion that something else takes over her. She says she's not Nina, she doesn't want to answer who she is, and then she starts strangling Dr. Gillen, repeating, I'm home. This is what we see of Monster Nina. So what was the memory that she gets stuck on at the end there? It's her return from the Red Rose Mansion massacre. It's that event at the mansion which is considered the moment which births the monsters in these kids' lives. Nina from experiencing it firsthand, and Johan through taking on those memories as the twins retell the story between them. Ultimately, coming to an understanding that Johan must have been the one who went. It's this memory that Monster Nina shares in her hypnotherapy scene, and it's also the origin for the alternate name of this theory, Nina's Original Sin. Typically, discussions around this scene will come to one of two conclusions. One is that the confusion of the blurry identities of the twins caused the memories of who went to unintentionally shift over to Johan. Two is that Johan purposefully took on those memories for Nina, along the lines of the All for Nina theory. The other angle, not often taken though, is that those memories were not willingly or accidentally taken, they were given, maliciously. Under hypnosis, we see Nina only say three things. I'm not Nina. I don't want to say. I'm home. And most people take those as three separate thoughts. The monster Nina theory suggests that those last two aren't separate at all. They are one thought. She doesn't want to say I'm home. She doesn't want to be the one to say I'm home. She doesn't want to be the one thrown aside by their mother. If the Red Rose Mansion Massacre birthed the monster, then it wasn't just Nina who returned to the Three Frogs. The monster came with her. A monster that seems to prefer itself hidden. A monster that seems to not want to be. A monster that doesn't want to say I'm home. So when she begins to talk to Johan, the monster offloads the painful memories to him, forcing the memories onto her brother so she doesn't have to bear them herself. Nina turning Johan into the monster so she doesn't have to be ruining her brother's life so she can continue on, blissfully unaware. Know of any other good strong theories? Drop them in the comments, and thanks for watching y'all, we'll see you G's in the next one.